Good afternoon. I'm Brad Nickerson, and this is We've Got Issues. Thank you for joining us today. Um, and thank you to Tri-City Community TV for, uh, for allowing us or helping us get these little programs out. Um, before I introduce our guest, I'd like to acknowledge, and I'm going to read this because I want to get it right. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that we, We've Got Issues is a nonpartisan citizen-based forum where we discuss topics of interest to the Tri-Cities. Um, today's interview is taking place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Kwikwetlem First Nations. We thank the Kwikwetlem who continue to live on these lands and care for them along with the waters and all that is above and below. Today, we're speaking with Diane Dilworth. She is a sitting member of the Port Moody Council. And um, Diane, thank you for being here today. It's a treat to be here. And I, I must say, that is a beautiful land acknowledgement that you just gave. It's good, but I read it. But, and it scares the bejesus out of me to do, <laughs> because I don't want to get it wrong. And it's a, it's a difficult thing, but it's an important thing. Very important. I think that we address in, as we go forward, in everywhere. I'm, I'm, maybe if we get time, I'll, I'll talk about, I'll ask some questions about that and what you're doing in Port Moody. Um, but what we're here to talk about is there's a coming election that's yes. coming up. And you are a sitting councillor. Um, you, you've run before, you're, you have experience that. You've run a couple of times, if I'm not mistaken, and you've been there for a while. Um, what I'd like to ask first is a, 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 get you to tell me a little bit about yourself and about that experience of being a counselor and what, and so there's three things in this about yourself, about being a counselor, and have you accomplished some of the things that you wanted to as a, a counselor? Just before I get into talking about my professional and political life, I want to talk about my personal life a little bit. And you okay. will see that that personal life that I have, uh, raising my children, living in my community, you will see that reference and you'll see how that has led me to do a lot of things that I've done and made a lot of decisions. Okay, let um, me just write this down. Diane avoiding the question. <laughs> okay. No, no um, 19 years old. I was a single mother. I had a son. I met a fabulous man. We had a daughter and I started working from home. And one of the jobs that I had was a recording secretary. So for a number of municipalities, including Port Moody, I went to every single council meeting and every committee meeting and I took all the meeting minutes. And I started this job in 1995 in Port Moody. And every meeting I went to, I looked around the table and I went, you know what? There's a voice missing at this table. There's one young woman. There's nobody that has kids that are using the library and the recreation uh, systems. Mm -hmm. This table is filled with people who are for the most part retired and have the luxury of time. Mm -hmm. And while they do provide a valid voice, I think there was some perspectives missing at the council table. Mm -hmm. So I... Um, ended up quitting that job as the council committee clerk. I ran for council, I got elected, and I go to all those same meetings and I make a lot less money than I did back then. <laughs> <laughs> less money, it's a step down, right? So so do I get, let me get this straight, on that council, that first council, there was a woman or? There was, it was Councillor okay. Megan Lottie. She's, uh, right. she's been serving for three years longer than I have. And she's there right now still, isn't she? She is still there. Yeah. I think there might be a healthy competition for who might be the longest sitting female Counselor. You're shooting for that, are you? Right. <laughs> I think but, we both are. But what's important is female voices on councils, right? That that because that's something that I think in the Tri Cities has been um, has been an issue is hear, hearing women. Now I don't I ought to be honest. I don't know Port Moody's history um, with regards to all the councils. I'm I'm pretty new to the game of being interested in that sort of thing. But I I do know in Port Coquitlam just. Well, I think that we went for a while with just a single mm -hmm. person as well, a single female for a number of years. But it's always trouble. It's always difficulty. In Port Moody had its first female elected uh, official uh, back in the 70s. Okay. And I think we've been pretty consistent. And if you look at the makeup of council today in Port Moody, uh, we have four women sitting sitting at the table. Of six people, right? Is it Out of six? seven, including the seven, mayor. Of course. So it's you can see we've number. made some great strides yeah, yeah, yeah. since, you know, at 1999 when yeah. I first ran. Yeah. And if I'm not mistaken, Coquitlam as well has a, has, does it? 
No, I know. I'm, I'm looking. You're in trying my head. to do the math. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, yeah. I, I, I'm, I think I'm, it's pretty close, but not quite there. Yeah, yeah. And and Port Moody right now, or Port Coquitlam has two. But it, but so hopefully, I'm, how do you feel about females running in? Um, do you know what, going like, back to this is your chance to say <laughs> more women get out there. More and women run. get out there. Please run. Men, men and women. You know, if you if you read the studies, sometimes they communicate in different ways and they think in different ways and they share perspectives in different ways. Mm -hmm. And uh, I I think. Uh, particularly with the four women on Port Moody Council this time around. There, there's a lot of empathy and there's a lot of sympathy and there's a lot of those soft skills that women bring to the table. Well, but let's, let's but they have a very loud voice as well. And that's good. Let's circle back to that a little later. Because right now what I'd like to do is, is um, find out a little bit about, again, I want to find out, go back to that part where you wouldn't answer the question, oh. which was, which was, um, I want to to know if in your first terms or in the first few years that you've you've been on council, have you achieved the things that you wanted to achieve and what are some of those things? When I first got elected, I don't know that I had, this is on my bucket list that I want to check off. It, mm -hmm. It's I want to serve and that's something that's been ingrained in me since I was a, a child. Mm -hmm. And when I look at that first year I was on city council, um, I learned a lot and I tended to sit back and sort of figure out how governance actually works rather than jumping in and trying to you know fix everything that I mm -hmm. that I saw was wrong and one of the first very significant issues that I took on was that of cosmetic pesticides mm -hmm. there had been a municipality in the province of Quebec yeah. that had actually banned cosmetic pesticides and when you say that you mean like I want to say DDT, but it but like it's, round it's, up. It's, it's, it's the cosmetic stuff that you use on your lawn to make it look pretty yeah. that our um, utilities like CP Rail used to regularly spray up and down the lines. And Port Moody became the second municipality in all of Canada to ban cosmetic pesticides. Yeah. So I'm very, very proud of that. Um, I can remember a time when the city was addressing sustainability. I think we, Port Moody is quite a leader in terms of issues around yeah. sustainability and environment. If I, if I didn't know that Port Moody was a bit of a leader in this area, I would think you're pandering to my green side. <laughs> Not at all, Brad. Yeah. Um, I can't remember. I think it was the early aughts. Um, yeah. Councillor Mike Clay, Councillor Megan Lottie and myself sat down with staff and wrote the first sustainability plan okay. for the city of Port Moody. Right. And that sustainability plan, you know, over, over decades, it might be two decades, um, has really provided the, the basis for a lot of what Port Moody has done when you look at our sustainability checklist for mm -hmm. developers who want to build in our community. When you look at the um, strong leadership role we're taking on climate action right. and, and what Port Moody is doing there. So we have been a leader and I, I will continue to see us as being a leader. Okay. So, okay, so, all uh, right. Strong on the environment. Or else, she says. No, <laughs> um, I, I I chaired a, a task force yeah. on housing, and it was my very okay. first housing task force in Port Moody, and it was looking at legalizing secondary suites. We haven't had legal suites for that long, and believe it or not, there's still municipalities throughout the province that don't have regulations around secondary suites. Mm -hmm. So, together with a, a number of community leaders, we sat down, we did our homework, and we brought forward what was um, uh, recommended regulations on how to ensure that people that were living in secondary suites were living in safe mm -hmm. environments mm -hmm. and that the owners of the house were taking responsibility for their tenants. Right. And so I guess that is um, when you speak towards uh, um, housing in that context, we're talking about affordability for people. It, it, affordability and diversity, diversity okay. of housing and, and affordability, they, right. the, the, the two can go hand in hand. Right. So, so those are issues, those are a couple of the issues that you worked in the past and you're, you're, you're uh, proud of them and so, so you should be. Going forward into this next election, um, can you tell me about what some of your goals are and, why, and, and what are things, why, why should be, people be excited about seeing you there again? I must be doing something right because I've been there since 1999. How many but elections is that? Give me. Running again this time, it'll be my seventh, uh, my seventh okay. term. Oh. I did take three years off when my daughter was 13 and my son was 16. Okay. And they needed me more than the city did. So I, okay. I did take a, a personal hiatus. Okay, good. So, all right. So you, I, and you must be doing something right. 
So what do, what do you think we're, what we should look forward to in Port Moody in the next administration? Well, let's, let's look at some things that we've been doing this term, working okay. together with some fellow colleagues. We worked on an affordable housing task force, okay. and, and it was myself and councillors uh, Roy A. Lubick and Lottie. And we literally spent six months and we looked at what were other municipalities doing that were really helping advance um, new homes and affordable homes in their communities. And we, we really looked uh, to New Westminster, who's got some very progressive policies. And as a result of us getting together, making recommendations that were endorsed unanimously all by Port Moody City Council, we have a family-friendly housing policy, which mandates that builders have to build so many two-bedroom, three-bedroom, in some case, four, four-bedroom units mm -hmm. uh, in their multifamily complexes. We have an inclusionary zoning policy right now where anyone that wants to come and build in Port Moody, depending on the size of their project, you know, they will have to include up to 15% of non-market housing for, right. for, for residents. I'm trying to think we have a tenant relocation policy. I think we were one of the Do, first. Okay, let me ask a question quickly, just for so people watching and because I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer at times. When you say non-market housing, what do you mean? So there's a, a spectrum of housing, and I did spend many years working with the uh, BC Nonprofit Housing Association and the Co-op Housing Federation of BC. So my remarks are coming from that ex experience working sure. working in the working in the field. Sure. So non-market housing is. Uh, housing that is somehow subsidized. So right at the very end of here, at the lowest end of the spectrum, you have those that uh, perhaps are experiencing homelessness and are living in shelters. Right. Uh, your next level on the spectrum is uh, supported living. And this might be people coming out of uh, penitentiaries. It might be people dealing with uh, mental health issues. It might be women fleeing uh, violent homes. Right. And, and they're in a supportive environment. Then the spectrum moves to where you look at um, market rental, where people are paying market rents for rent. Now that's on the market spectrum. That's correct. Okay. And then you go into a home ownership of perhaps apartments, townhouses, sure. until you get to the, the full spectrum as full ownership, right. uh, regardless of what type of housing okay. that is. Yeah. So non-market housing might be for people who are... Um, who need assistance. All right, so, so I didn't mean to interrupt, but I think that it's important. And it's not just things. those that, that need some assistance, it, it comes down to affordability. And I'll, mm -hmm. I think you've seen, certainly from the provincial government, you've seen a lot of push on getting some of this missing middle housing. Mm -hmm. And it, it's homes where families that are earning between perhaps 30000 and $80,000 a year right. can find a place that they can afford to live. Right. And so, and so now I'm going to circle back to the percentage. You're making sure that developers who are building in your community are providing that kind of housing as well. The, the goal the goal is 15%, 15 percent, depending on negotiations for additional density or um, community space or childcare space. It, that may be fleeting, but that is the expectation when a builder walks in the door. Yeah. So, uh, and this might be tough because we didn't talk about this in the beforehand, but the percentage of growth in the um, tri cities is in the coming years is projected quite high. Will that 15% keep up with what's needed with the growth of, um, of Port Moody? Well, I certainly hope so. Well, uh, but I, hope isn't, yeah. hope isn't gonna help, I, right? I can tell you the provincial government mandated that every municipality uh, prepare a housing needs assessment report. Right. And so the city hired a consultant who came in and did a very in-depth, comprehensive look at what we have uh, existing today, yeah. looked at population projections, where is it uh, projected that those people are going to come from, what are those housing needs going to be, mm -hmm. how many people are on the wait list at BC Housing mm -hmm. for uh, subsidized housing, and came up with uh, this quite fulsome housing needs assessment report. And on our council agenda tonight, we're actually looking at a housing action plan that has been derived from that needs assessment report. Mm -hmm. Municipalities are now mandated to create a housing needs assessment report um, every time they update their OCP, the official community plan, right. which traditionally is you know, anywhere from, from five, to, five to eight years. So municipalities have to take that open-eyed look every five to seven years and say, what is it that we need to build in our community mm -hmm. and are we building it? Yeah, how's it going? 
Uh, things have been a little bit slow in Port Moody, but I see where we're, you can see uh, a lot of construction on the ground right now. Right. Um, Port Moody slowed down a number of years ago, and um, it's just been recently that we've got a number of uh, uh, projects on the go. We've got some smaller ones that you see coming to uh, fruition, certainly the purpose-built rentals on Dudney. Uh, mm -hmm. We've got some purpose-built rentals on St. John. But you've also seen a number of market condos, certainly along Murray Street, down toward Rocky Point Park. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're still trying to make sense and, and grasp with some of the larger developments, such as Coronation Park. Mm -hmm. which is back on council's agenda this evening. We have to look at what is planned for um, our transit-oriented development when you look at the giant parking lot in Moody Centre where we have the West Coast Express and we have SkyTrain. There, there are some differing opinions on what should be put there. And uh, I don't know if you're aware, but uh, last week, three provincial ministers uh, jointly wrote a, a letter to uh, the mayor's office in Port Moody and shared it with council, uh, asking us to focus higher levels of density within our TOD areas, particularly the TOD where the West Coast Express and the SkyTrain is. And so with that kind of density, which, um, which um, I understand, uh, all communities are struggling with at this point. Um, just the, the, you just sparked a question for me. It's yeah. like what's what's going to be done about transit in that kind of case? Because because you know just from experience, I've lived in the, the Tri Cities for thirty years, a little more maybe, um, and I've watched the, just I've watched the traffic get more and more difficult. As the, I think, if I'm not mistaken, um, we've seen a like a 40 a 40 percent growth of people in the last 20 30 years and and it, it all goes hand in hand people and housing and traffic and i understand a lot of frustration because i see that in in, in port moody we literally have two roads uh, two main roads that go through Port Moody, one being St. John Street, and then you have Clark, which connects to, to Murray. And that's the, that's the commuter traffic ways, and they do get congested. Um, in an ideal world, we would have everybody riding their cycles or uh, um, ride sharing or taking transit that's right outside their doors, mm -hmm. but uh, unfortunately that's not a reality yet. Mm -hmm. um, traffic is also compounded by, the traffic in Port Moody is just not the people that live in Port Moody. We have we have quite a, a healthy commute coming from Coquitlam, certainly on the, the new community up in Burke Mountain. But we are always looking at ways to activate um, activate roadways to enhance a pedestrian or a cyclist experience, and hopefully that will help. Um, I, I, I'm hoping that if we can provide more uh, opportunities for electric vehicles, uh, perhaps that would be a solution in that people could only use um, electric vehicles on, on HOV lanes, for mm -hmm. example. And, and that sort of incentivized electric vehicles and it's kept all the traffic on the HOV lane, which is often underutilized while people maximize the regular mm -hmm. lane. Is that there are electric vehicles? You're on council, so you have a, a bit of an opportunity to shape that argument and and direct the conversation is that is that a priority for you or is that a priority for your council Do you know i think addressing climate action is certainly one of the very most top priorities for the city of port moody to the extent that we have a climate action plan mm -hmm. um, that has a bill that's in the millions and millions of, of dollars mm -hmm. sorry somewhere i don't know what you just said somehow oh. <laughs> i don't know what you what... so so uh, I'm not on the Climate Action Committee. I, okay. haven't, I haven't been a part of it, but the city has adopted a climate action plan with a multi-year phased approach okay. to activities and initiatives that the city can take on to address reducing GHG emissions right, right. and okay. addressing the uh, climate crisis that we've identified. Right, so, and, and okay. And are you on track or are you, you know? I believe we are on track right. certainly the initiatives that we have been addressing in the first number of years have been funded they've been funded through grants from other levels of government and they've been funded by the city so you are on track and that relates to electric cars as being just it, one small component there, so of it yeah you don't have to worry it, about it's that. one very small component okay. in that the city's provided uh, chargers throughout our municipality yeah. when uh, a developer or builders coming forward we are certainly 
uh, demanding that EV charging stations or at least the basic infrastructure for them are provided. Are you doing, are you like, that's a strong word, you're demanding it or is that like, there's just it, an it's within, it's, 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 you know what, it's, it's. Do you have to demand it or developers, are developers me, like me, reluctant me, to put those in? Sometimes there is, there is a cost to it. It's something that can be negotiated. to be negotiated. <laughs> Sorry. Like how, how come it has to be negotiated? Just put the damn things, things in. in. Like, and, and do you know like do you have to negotiate windows? Do you have to negotiate doors and frames? No, just put them in so we'll have them. Sorry. No, do you know what? Yeah. But, but that that when when you talk about demanding for buildings that are backing up along the SkyTrain, there yeah. is a specific standard of soundproofing and windows and everything that you must use. So you negotiate those things yeah. is what you're saying. Yeah. So you negotiate. Okay. But you don't negotiate windows, but you're going to put them in. Yes. Uh, anyway. Yeah. Anyway, uh, I, I I'm, see where I'm you're going. On a, I'm getting on a track. You right? know what? Developers, uh, builders quite often need to be nudged. It's, it's, it's about money, right? It's yes. about like, can we get away with, can we get away with this? And I guess then it becomes your job as a council. So, sorry, I'm kind of going off the track here. It's I'm having okay. more of a, like, <laughs> like a conversation. Um, it becomes your job as a council to sort of set it. Well, it's you're setting a standard for your community as to what level of expectation you should have for them if they want to build in your community. And that's good. Um, and, and sorry, I'm going off in my track. I'm trying to take you down this environmental path because I like to. Um, you can have me back in another show and we'll talk well, just all about uh, that. There are, you know that there are other things I want to talk to you about. Um, but, uh, so what have we talked about so far? We've talked about, so that environmental thing, we've talked about housing um, a, and development. I'm, I'm, can we talk about something fun? Yes, that's what I want to do. Like, 20, this is all in, about you. In 2013, okay. I helped in the bring past. back oh, something you did in the past. A, a civic. Okay. We brought back a civic parade for for yeah. decades. Port a Moody had an parade. annual parade. Yeah, and somewhere it just disappeared, and yeah. it had been decades. And 2013 was the city's uh, 100th anniversary, our, our big centennial, and we brought back a community parade. Okay, and there was thousands of people lining the streets and we held this parade in 2013 and we held it again in 2014 and unfortunately in subsequent years I just could not convince a majority of council to allocate the funding to, to bring back the parade yeah. but you know what it, it's something I'm not going to let go of okay. because we're one of the only municipalities that doesn't have uh, we have car free day but that's different but you also have like that you have golden spike days and uh, Canada Day, and in this Canada. past weekend we just had Rib Fest. Okay. So there, there is a lot of events, and when Rib Fest is more of a commercial endeavor, is it not? No, it's not. Um, a it, community it, thing. It is very much a community thing. It's uh, organized by Coquitlam Rotary. Or sorry, <laughs> Port Moody Rotary is not going to like that faux pas. Um, the Port, the Port Moody Rotary. That's my job to and, pull out those sort of things. And then the, they rely heavily on volunteers. I okay. literally spent two shifts slinging beer and serving food this past weekend, and all of their money earned, their net profits goes back into charitable endeavors. So right. no one's walking away with a bunch of money okay, in okay. their their hand, except for the ribbers, yeah. who obviously do make money off off their product. Yeah, that kind of thing happens. So. Um, so we have a citizen satisfaction survey on the agenda later this evening and one of the things that we hear from our community is they want more events. They want more family events, they want more free events and I think something like a parade um, certainly would help satisfy that desire. Okay. And moving forward I'm uh, certainly going to be focused on looking at how we can better support our um, families and our young people with free entertainment Celebrating opportunities. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Okay, so I want to. I, I think we only we're we're down. We only have a few minutes left. Um, and there's a question that I want to get into because um, my my in creative partner in this endeavor, um, Nancy and Furness and I have always um, spoken to everybody that comes by. Um, we've talked about, uh, and it's been a goal of ours to advocate for. Um, in all of the communities, Tri-City communities, a, um, an environment where both sides of um, any kind of issues are heard and um, respected. And I want to talk to you because I know that in um, Port Moody there have been contentious times mm -hmm. on council. I want to talk about that. I want to talk about, uh, or I, I don't want to talk about it, I want you to talk about okay. it. Um, 
I want to, I just want to hear your perspective as to how you think that we could have councils in the Tri Cities that are um, that are more uh, that speak better to each other. I've, I've slaughtered how that yeah. should yeah, sound. Yeah, I, 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 I get, where, I get where you're coming from, because the very first time we had a discussion, I think I referred you to James Hogan's book uh, about toxicity in the workplace. Maybe. And it's it was called, I'm Right and You're an Idiot. Yeah. Yeah. I thought you were talking to me no. when you said that. Okay. <laughs> because and, my wife says that. And, that. and, and uh, this has been, uh, out of the six councils I've been on, this one has certainly been the most challenging. Mm -hmm. And you're right, there seems to be this us and them or them and us uh, sort of divisiveness. And uh, Port Moody's been a particularly bad example of this because there is such division on our council. And every time we get together and talk about how is it that we can get over this, we tend to go back to the same places where we are. And, and I think there's, we need to get really uncomfortable with each other before we can get to that place where we can have that very honest, transparent, respectful conversations. I, I know it, it's, it's quite sad to say there's, there's some Tuesdays where I feel like I'm going into a battlefield and I need to pre be prepared to battle for my position. Mm -hmm. And that shouldn't be the case. When I think back on councils before, we, we, we would have some very um, deliberate debates without hurting people's feelings. Mm -hmm. And I think if we get back to the fact that we're all people, we're not just an opinion at the table that is there to be attacked, yeah. personally or politically. So, so how do you do that? You get to a place where you're open and honest and vulnerable to each other and you make that commitment to be better, to do better. Okay. And, and you need that to happen unanimously. And when you have people at the table that aren't prepared to do that, unfortunately, you're not gonna get to that place. I, I think it also comes under um, the, the pretext of, of having strong leadership, leadership that will model that. If there's seven people on a council, uh, it's not just one person that needs to step and say, this is what we have to do. You, you have to have leadership right at the top that models the behavior uh, that is expected of all members of council. And unfortunately, that doesn't happen in Port Moody. Um, I think you may be uh, aware that I, I personally brought a recommendation to the Lower Mainland Local Government Association looking to enshrine a provincial code of conduct because right now every municipality sort of has its own code of conduct. Port Moody was one of the first in, in the Lower Mainland to create one. But the, the code of conduct process of complaints and resolution, that responsibility is left to the seven members of council. Mm -hmm. and, and so it very much is a, a partisan process and, and not a, um, what's the word I'm looking for, non-biased approach to dealing with what member of council might feel is, is a, a complaint or a slight or a breach of the code of conduct. Okay. I um, I, I'm almost out of time for okay. today. I'm almost sure that I am just about out of time. But maybe I can squeeze in this one question that's on this path. Um, do you think there'd be any room for like a, um, a uh, an ombudsman of some sort or some Abs kind absolutely. of counsel? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I know... You'd feel comfortable with that. A absolutely. And that's certainly something that's been debated. Uh, quite ferociously and agreed to at that Lower Mainland Local Government Association, which is the regional body of elected officials here. We also have our provincial union of BC municipalities, and they've had that debate, and it certainly has been um, the city of New Westminster have mm -hmm. been very, very strong advocates for this ombudsman, and uh, I believe that we're going to make some process there because, unfortunately, um, you've seen a lot of politicians gone wild or gone bad or however you want to say it. And right now there's not a, a provincial entity or a piece of provincial legislature that can deal. Can we end where we started with, I, with reconciliation? With reconciliation, sure. We started with that beautiful land acknowledgement okay. and I want to acknowledge uh, the tremendous work that is taking place in Port Moody in terms of reconciliation. Uh, it was some time ago when I chaired the Heritage Commission, we looked at our Heritage Award and it was completely based on uh, a scenario of uh, colonialism. And so we, we reworked that. Mm -hmm. Most recently on um, 
the day of the Indigenous people, June 21st, rather than have a council meeting, Port Moody City Council um, had their own land acknowledgement uh, released and all of council and senior staff went through a blanket mm. uh, exercise. Uh, our staff went through a blanket exercise earlier in the day. We actually had a public blanket exercise where we invited members of the public to come in. And I think if you've gone through one of those, you, you know it's an incredible, powerful experience. And uh, city council right now has um, a significant priority of looking at how we can best advance reconciliation um, through council, through staff, through our community, in our events, in everything we do. Sure, that's good. Thank you Thank for you. that. Thank, Thank you, you Brad. Thank you, Diana Dilworth, for being here today. Always a giving pleasure. Giving us an insight into you and your your career and the work that you do on city on Port Moody City Council. Thank you again to Tri City Community TV for hosting these events and um, helping us helping us that we've got issues um, speak to the people in our community who are in charge of. Uh, our community, so to speak. Great. So again, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much for watching.